Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending session three, Self-Sufficiency Fund, Building and Placing a Skilled Workforce Through Community-Based Partnerships. My name is Reba Bacon. I am your host for the session and a statewide representative for the Self-Sufficiency Fund grant program. During this session, you will learn from community-based organizations on how they recruit and maintain trainees, manage their training funds, hear, and hear from business partners on how and why partnering with a community-based organization to um, hire skilled candidates is a cost savings and time savings benefit. But first, let's hear testimonies from recipients that have benefited from the self-sufficiency training fund. Thank you. Jennifer, is your mic on? Uh, my mic is not on. There you go. <laughs> um, oh, I'm going first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so my name is Jennifer Cobb, and I attended Skill Point August of last year, and I graduated from their pre-apprentice electrical class in September. Um, I then and then that's that. But um, how I got started, my my brother, he's a journeyman electrician, and he was just trying to get me to um, join what he believed was going to be like the family business. He does have his uh, daughter in a apprenticeship, and um, I worked in an office previously. I was a I was a receptionist for a doctor's office. And um, my brother was like, uh, you got to study for this test um, for the IBW. He is a, he's in a union state. And um, so I was, I was sitting at my office job studying for this apprenticeship test that I really knew nothing about. Um, when I got the call back to the office, they were, they fired me. So I was let go um, and uh, I went immediately to this school that I, I didn't even know the name. Um, I went to the school um, that my friend had attended and I, I knew that he didn't have to pay for it. Um, so I, I went there and I was like, I'll, I'll take a few classes just to, you know, while I'm unemployed. And I pull into the parking lot and it says IBEW. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not fate. Um, I go inside, she gives me a number to call. Um, I, I, I leave a message and within two days I get a call back and they're like, we have an electrical class. And <laughs> I'm like, okay, um, yes, I wanna sign up within two weeks. Um, I was in Alan, Alan's um, pre-apprentice class for electrical. Um, I didn't know anything about tools. Uh, I didn't even hang pictures up in my house myself. Like I didn't do any of the hands-on things. Um, and uh, within, within the month, I, I mean, I, I, I knew tools I had never seen before. Um, I was, I was, uh, I was just willing to, to, to learn and, and grasp this, this new field. And um, I took it seriously because uh, Alan pushed that like it was serious. And once the jobs came in and, um, and just explained um, what they had to offer, it was like, okay, yes, this is, uh, this is real and I can make a, a career out of it. Um, two weeks after graduation, I was out in the construction field, um, applying all the, the knowledge that Alan had, had taught and um, he didn't sugarcoat anything. What he said it was gonna be, it, it was and um, I, I took a pay cut to, to start this career in, in, um, in the electrical field. And a year later, I'm now making more than I was at my office job. Um, 
uh, working eight to five, I would come home like exhausted. Um, just, and I was sitting in a chair all day. I would, I would come home exhausted. And um, like, I didn't feel like cooking dinner. I didn't feel like doing the laundry. I allowed it to pile up and getting up at four in the morning. It's not like that. Um, I definitely, um, I have learned to knock things out in the, in the, in the field. And I take the same attitude home. So when I get home at three and three thirty, I'm, I'm sitting up there. I'm, I'm cooking the dinner. I'm, 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 you know, as the laundry's coming out, I'm, I'm taking it, I'm, I'm folding it. I'm putting it away. Um, just knock it out. And, um, I've, I've, I've grown emotionally, physically, like I'm stronger. Um, I'm stronger mentally and, um, and, and it, and it's, and, and it's all because of, of, of like the foundation that like skill point uh, laid out there. And um, I wasn't surprised by anything um, simply because I was, I was, you know, I was given the, 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 the how to and just what to expect. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very grateful. Um, my life has changed. I have two little boys who, they're, they're my little handymen around the house. Um, they're, they're, they're seeing if they can use mommy's tools. And um, I don't think it's often that little boys can actually look up to their mother, but my boys do. They, my youngest, he, he says all the time that he's an electrician and he tries to just create things with, uh, with the scrap wire. Um, that I actually had from uh, that I had from Skill Point, and he'll just he'll flick on the light and he'll say, "Mom, I'm an electrician," um, and uh, I think I've I've given them something to be proud of, and I mean I wouldn't be mad if they followed into my steps of um, of getting into this trade, um, and. I mean, I could have, I, I could have been, I could have been depressed that I, that I had just been let go of my job. I could have been, I, I could have been just sad about it. I could have, uh, there's just so many things that could have happened from me being let go. And that wasn't the case. Like I was, I was a student. Like you all really gave me, uh, Skill Point gave me just a, a, a more purpose. And, um, and, and I'm just, I'm highly grateful for it. But thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful testimony. Uh, I would like to move on and I'm gonna remind my um, um, recipients to remember you have three minutes. Um, so great, greatly done, Jennifer. I greatly appreciate you coming and giving your testimony while you're still working. No, uh, oh, have yes. a great day and stay safe, wear your mask. Yeah, I will. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on with Roderick Brown. Are you connected, Roderick? Roderick? I and think we can't his get from Roderick. phone is um, muted. He's, is he muted? Yeah, it look, look like he's muted. Okay. We'll move on to uh, Try Answering. Are you able to speak, Try? Yes. Thank you. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Will you please share your brief testimony? With oh us? yes. Uh, my name is Tri uh, I started. I started uh, through the parenting center, but uh, things didn't work out with that, and then that's how I was able to get through a self sufficient program, but. It, I don't think it was in place yet, but thank God that it was because I wouldn't be able to start welding. I'm I'm welding right now at Saber, and it's been it's been nothing but ups from there. Like before that, I was just working at staffing companies, like different staffing agencies, like just basic ninety days, not even ninety days, not really, you know, not something I wasn't passionate about. And so I was just going from different staffing agencies, trying to find, you know 
find something to provide for my daughter. She's three. And once I was able to get approved for the self-sufficient program and took the welding school, it's, it's been nothing but blessings coming my way. I've been able to do more for my family and just just basically just completely changed my life. And uh, at first I didn't even have benefits. I didn't have nothing, nothing to, you know, to pass down to my daughter. I didn't have literally nothing financially, all that stuff. It just, once I finished the welding program last month, uh, I was able to get a job in like two weeks, but I, I've had job offers that I've never, like never wouldn't even gotten before welding program like it was it was crazy to me how just how easily it was just happening and then uh melinda and everybody up here at clc was able to help me push more towards jobs that was benefiting me even more and that's how i was able to choose a decision with saber and i've been up there and i've been loving it it's it's something that i've never even done in my life and it's just i'm passionate i wake up i don't care if i'm working 14 hours I, I still love it because it's something that's that's providing for my daughter and I can just pass it on down to her. Everything I learned in school, I've, I've literally taken it right up there to Sabre and it, it benefited me a lot. Even the projects I've done in school, I still got them in my cabinet at home because I, I admire it so much because it's, it's something that really changed my life. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Trance. And I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of each Jennifer as well. Roger, you're connected. May we hear from you today? Hello, how you doing? <laughs> Hello. Sorry, I'm late. That's I'm okay. trying to work at first. That's like time. Uh, yes, ma'am. How you doing? To everybody, doing? it's a blessing to be here. Uh, I came to the lunch pad. I was in search of employment, and I was approached by Miss Young, who was the recruiter at the time. I'm not sure it's still a recruiter. I've been gone for long now. Um, I enrolled in the program, the Houston Lunch Pad of Houston, Texas. Uh, the owner is Mr. Prince Goods. My teacher was uh, Ms. Tiara Price. Wonderful teacher, wonderful teacher. Uh, she takes the time. She makes sure you got everything that you needed. Uh, the program was an eight-week program. Uh, I also brought my nephew in the class with me and, and I encouraged him, highly encouraged him to complete it because he had been in and out of trouble. But uh, I just try to be a the, the light to someone's darkness at all times. And so therefore, Mr. Goods and Miss Price were actually the light to my darkness in my time of need, other than my Holy Spirit, which I choose to call God. <laughs> um, I successfully completed the program, which was an eight week program. Uh, throughout the period of my eight week program, uh, eight of those weeks, no, actually it was a four month program and it was eight of those weeks, I had to uh, do some on the job learning with the city of Houston, which is where I'm currently employed at right now. And Upon my completion of the program, I uh, I got hired on as a temp as of November of 2019, and I successfully completed my temp services. And the city took me on, hired me on as a permanent as of June 29th of last year. So now I'm currently working as a city of Houston employee, which I love my job. It's just, this is like a dream come true to me. And as I stated in my city of Houston interview, I served my country in which I'm also a Navy veteran. So what privilege would it be to serve my city, which is the city of Houston. And I love the city because the city pays all my bills. And I still from time to time keep in touch with Mr. Goods. And I have a lot of people that support me and now this is like, like I stated, this is the dream job. So, I mean, what better way to go? And the lunch pad helped me get here because as a child, I grew up and I watched all of the city employees. And I was like, wow, that's what I want to be one day other than, you know, joining the military after I got out of the military. So, 
and I can't think of I can't think of any better place to be right now. Well, thank you, Roger. A great testimony, all three of you. I'm so happy to hear your great successes in the professional world, and I pray that you all continue to do and strive for the best. Thank you very much. Now we will move into our panel discussion. Uh, we have Mr. Prentice Goods, director of the Houston Launchpad. We also have Aaron Hill, the Skill Point Alliance, yep. as well as Kevin Brackmeyer, the Skill Point Alliance. And we have Thomas Palmer with CLC Incorporated. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining. We also have Philip Harris, and we also have um, Kelly Parker with the Ship Channel Constructions. Those are the business partners that are on the panel discussion today. I will start out by asking one question to the panelists. Uh, Mr. Gush, you can go first. What advice would you uh, have for other grantees on how to successfully recruit trainees? I think he cannot hear. Mr. Goods? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was speaking to Mr. Parker on the other line. Okay. Uh, what advice would you give to other grantees on how, success, how to successfully recruit trainees? Well, uh, again, my name is Prentice Goods. I'm the program director of the Houston Launchpad. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, were successful in and, and, and how we uh, recruited our uh, participants was uh, initially going to the local workforces, uh, the AGCs and, uh, and uh, building a partnership, a community partnership and uh, making our presence known there on a daily basis. Uh, we recruited uh, diligently uh, to let people know we had this program and uh, it was uh, a great program for the community and we built relationships with the staff at the, at the different uh, locations. Uh, we let them know every uh, move that we had planned on doing. We gave them our timeline on what day the class was gonna start. Uh, we predetermined what trades that we would be uh, offering uh, every eight weeks. Uh, also, they allowed us to have our graduations uh, at their locations, which, you know, you had people that was in there looking for jobs and they would see these people in the back clapping and enjoying itself and, and uh, being congratulated for uh, doing the eight week courses. So they started asking questions about, hey, what's, you know, what is it that y'all are doing? And uh, some of them uh, became interested in, uh, you know, attending the school and, and, and getting their certification. Uh, we just basically kept it uh, straight to the point when we go recruit, we don't try and, you know, oversell the program or anything like that. You know, we just tell them the truth. You know, we have this eight week course. Uh, if you have something that, uh, you that's uh that will get you a job uh with in a faster time than this eight weeks where we commend you for that but if you don't you know give us a chance to give you a uh to help you get three certifications which is osha 10 a nccr core and uh, a particular trade and uh, a lot of them say okay but and and another thing that we were able to tell them is that we had employers already on board that would interview them on their graduation date. And so they found that very rewarding. And uh, so they gave us a chance. A lot of them said, well, we're just gonna give this chance and see if this really, if this is really true or not. Or not. So uh, having the infrastructure set up ahead of time, it helps, you know, I mean, having the community partners, that helps. Uh, you know, having, seeing employers come out and speak and and interview everybody one-on-one, -on -one, that helps. And you know, word of mouth uh, kind of takes over from there. And uh, I, I, I see uh, uh, Kelly just logged in. Uh, welcome, Kelly. Hello. And uh, 
And and that's what we kind of uh, did. You know, Kelly is an employer that 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 we worked with for years, and uh, we have a friendship beyond you know the fact that he's an employer and we uh, do the training. You know, we always talking about the needs in the community, and he's always updating me on projects. And so I have this information to take to the students. And, and, and they like to hear that, you know, and our employees, they come out and speak to the students while they in class to let them know, hey, you know, you stand a chance to get on with our company if you do everything you need to do, you know, what doing this classroom uh, por portion of, of the process. And a lot of employees found it impressive that a person was willing to train for eight weeks and with no pay they found that real impressive. You know, they say, wow, if a person giving up that kind of time to get on, uh, to go off into this type of field, that's the person we want to, you know, at least interview and, and take it from there. So I commend, you know, our community partners, uh, Kelly Parker being one of the main, uh, you know, players in, in our process uh, of getting these people trained and, and hired. And when we was putting this together, we figured that, you know, we, we couldn't really compete with the community colleges and things like that. And people these days kind of want things done like in a microwave or yesterday. So we designed an eight week program. We figured that that was uh, probably at the borderline of uh, either keeping a person or losing a person. You know, uh, people that, you know, they saying, hey, I got to go to work. And we thought that that would be just enough time to get them three certifications and uh, uh, opportunity to go to work. You know, like in Roger's case, the city of Houston, uh, he's one of our sisters, one of many. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you know, the city partnered with us. They're, they are a community partner. But, right. uh, you know, that's so that's some of the things, Miss Ms. Bacon, that, that we do to try and... Uh, make sure our program is, uh, you know, effective. Well, thank you, Mr. Goods, on that. Uh, I'm going to move forward with Aaron and Kevin. We really don't have that much time, but I want to try to get everyone in because I greatly appreciate you uh, participating with us this morning. And I want to uh, pass that same question to you and A Kevin and Aaron. Uh, just briefly give us a synopsis on how you what recommendations or what do you do to maintain those trainees, not only recruit them, but maintain them? Do you provide any incentives while they're in the training program to make sure, because as Mr. Goods pointed out, they're not receiving a, uh, any type of pay. So what do you do to not only recruit them to your campus, but how do you keep them to stay for your whole training period? Sure, and Reba, thank you for inviting Skill Point. We really appreciate it. And good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Hill. I'm the program director at Skill Point Alliance. Uh, we're a small nonprofit in Austin, Texas, that uh, it sounds like provides very similar training programs to uh, Houston Launchpad. Uh, we have uh, short programs that are very rapid and concise. They're about four to eight weeks long, and uh, we provide cert specific certifications during, during the training. Um, I don't have much to add beyond what Prentice said. He, he touched on a lot of really great things, uh, community partnerships with the local workforce board, uh, as well as other nonprofits and word of mouth. We have a strong presence whenever we can in community events. And then for self-sufficiency funds specifically, because of the target population being uh, you know, TANF uh, recipients or uh, households that have children, I, uh, one thing that we've found successful is partnering with parents uh, uh, support centers at the local AI or at the ISDs uh, in Austin and around it, as well as nonprofits that actually connect with parents who have children in their homes. Uh, that helps us um, in terms of also being a trusted partner if we're partnering with one of those agencies that already has relationships with parents. It makes a really big difference than us just trying to market to a population that's already bombarded with opportunities. Um, it and does. Part of your question about incentives. Uh, similar to Prentice, we don't pay our, our, our students to take classes. We don't have stipends. Um, it depends on some funding streams. Maybe we're able to, but very, very rarely. So that's why, similar to what he mentioned, we keep our programs very short. 
We do provide wraparound services, so connection to childcare, tools, and bus passes, and and you know maybe food when we're in person if we're doing that. Um, but otherwise, we don't provide a lot of incentives. Uh, we do, though, connect them to employer partners while they're in the program. Uh, and because our programs are so rapid, I think we, we have a really high success rate. We have about 90% or more of our students will graduate every year. Thank you. Thomas Palmer, because you CLC is in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, do you find difficulties with your trainees uh, getting to your campus? And if so, what, how do you uh, work with them to make sure that they, transportation is there for them to get to, your, get to train as well? And then share any soft skills or essential skills training that you have incorporated into your curriculum. Well, we, uh, uh, I guess the, one of the major uh, barriers these guys face, of course, is transportation and getting back and forth to school. So we had to partner. We don't have any of that money uh, to provide bus passes to the skills grant. So we partner with the other community uh, partners to uh, that do have uh, funds for the for the bus <laughs> passes uh, and, and for the gas cards and things like this to uh, get back and forth to uh, our training program. Uh, and as far as incentives, the, the major incentive that, that we hold out in front of them is, hey, you have opportunity here to get a skill that's going to get you a really good paying job. Uh, and uh, they'll graduate our program. They'll take they'll test for the 1G welding certification or the entry le level uh, the certification in machining and things like that. So they could, even though they have, you know, the only, the only experience they would have would be in school, they will at least go to an employer. They'll have passed a welding test or passed a machining uh, entry level test. And uh, that, that is the, the, uh, the thing that we hold out in front of them to hopefully motivate them to uh, complete the training and, and uh, you know, to be, be there, be on time. And, and uh, those are things uh, the, uh, that we try to, be, to build in our students as well as the skill of welding or skill of machining or the, the uh, you know, the, the computer skills we try to build into them uh, those skills that employers look for, uh, timeliness, uh, reliability, is this. Awesome, thank you for that response. Kelly, would you like to share as well uh, with uh, Philip, if you're available, if your mic on also, can you please share uh, from a business perspective, how uh, going to the, we're partnering with the community-based organizations to fill your workforce. How has that benefited your organization? Kelly? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so we started working with Prentice in 2014. We're going on seven years working with him. Um, we went to Prentice when we got a visit from the Department of Labor and they said that we needed to hire more minorities and women in the construction field. Um, we reached out to several different community groups and Prentice is the only one who responded of all the people that the Office of Civil Rights gave us the contact. And so uh, we started out for, you know, Prentice to help us with the need, but down, down through the seven years, it's been mutual in that uh, we try to make all of his graduations and we believe in 100% what he does. Um, he's right in that they persevere for the eight weeks to get the training. And so that does mean a lot to us when we, when we go. So we go to graduations and we interview, we stay late and we interview every person who wants to interview with us. And we hire quite a few of Prentice's people. Uh, the very first person who I hired through Prentice is now a foreman. Um, he stuck with us there as a labor made all up to a foreman. And what we tell him, you, know, you make a foreman, you make good money, you get, a, you, know, you get to drive a truck home, get a gas card. We get health insurance, really good health insurance. And so that guy, the very first guy I hired, still works with us and he's and he's a foreman. And so it it they can they can make it. They sometimes they need a little help. Um, and so we try to provide that as much as possible, but it's been very beneficial to us. I know it's been beneficial to apprentice, but more importantly, it's, it's been beneficial to the people who've gone through his program. They get a lot out of it. Thank you. Philip, can you hear me? 
Okay. So uh, in a few words, Kevin, can you share with us um, if you had a choice to recommend any changes or revamp the pro program parameters with self-sufficiency, what would you like to see different or revamped to help the program succeed even further? Thank you, Reba. It's uh, really great to be here and thanks for inviting us. Um, I think if I had a choice, um, I would uh, expand the definition of those who are at risk uh, of poverty and possibly uh, modify the requirements that they are just parents. Um, I know it's just a, a, that this is a TANF funded program, uh, but there are able-bodied adults without dependents that qualify for SNAP. So if I had my choice, I would change this so that um, able-bodied adults uh, without dependents could also qualify for self-sufficiency. Right. Uh, and in our experience as a training provider during COVID, uh, we found it very difficult for parents to enroll and succeed in training because a lot of parents have had to, you know, to stay home and take care of their children. And even though we're able to offer the training to parents virtually, uh, they just were not able to go to work. So that was a real struggle for them, uh, specifically those who had children in the in the house and had to stay home with them. Uh, determining eligibility with those trainees, did any of you, uh, meaning Thomas, Prentice, Aaron, Kevin, did you all experience any difficulties in trying to verify the eligibility? No major difficulties hey, I, in verifying eligibility once, um, because we have a pretty lengthy process, uh, onboarding process that our admissions team uh, will take a take an applicant through from the point where they apply all the way through uh, when they're first day in class. Uh, and so we, during that process, we're collecting documentation um, and verifying that to make sure that the documentation we've received matches the eligibility requirements uh, in the contract. Um, so I don't think we've had difficulty in that regard. We did have to pivot to touchless and uh, virtual document collecting, which uh, meant that we had to get a little creative at times in terms of how we were taking pictures of documents. <laughs> and, uh, but in terms of actually verifying, uh, fortunately, no, our process was, was set up so that we could, we could verify pretty easily. Thank you. Mr. Goods? Uh, the same. I, I kind of can piggyback on what Aaron just said. We didn't really have any difficulty. Uh, some students, uh, we got their documentations once they started class, but they did follow through on making sure we got everything we needed for them to be eligible for, you know, for the program and the training. Uh, again, COVID has changed the playing field and, and, and we're trying to do a lot of things virtual. Uh, so, we are uh, emailing things back and forth, faxing documentations back and forth. And uh, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of where we at right now is just trying to make the adjustments to be as less, uh, I guess, uh, in the face of the individual as possible for right now. So, uh, you know, we, again, we just trying to figure new ways to move forward, but in the past we had no problems. Thomas? You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, uh, we collect the documents up front, you know, picture ID, birth certificate, uh, high school diploma, GED. Um, we, uh, whether or not, if they're employed, we get a, a, a pay stub, but most of them are, uh, you know, of course, that we recruit are not employed. Um, and uh, the proof of child, either birth certificate of, of the child or some proof that they have a child, such as some, some type of school record or a medical record where they're listed as a uh, responsible party, uh, court documents. But we collect all that up front, uh, and we, we found that if we don't get it up front, sometimes it's hard to chase them down later and get it. We've been fairly successful with that one the few times that this has happened, but we pretty much required them to have those documents when they uh, first enroll into our, our programs. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that's been our experience. We, we try to collect it before the, we provide them any services because chasing it down later, you know, you was so much, you know, you're so busy with everything that, you know, you don't want to, 
uh, forget that or, you know, fall, fall through the cracks or something like that. So we collect it up front. So when you say you collect it, do you have a, a person on your staff that specifically does your tracking of individuals, uh, whether it be a case manager or what have you? Yes, we have our case manager. We, we maintain a spreadsheet uh, of uh, all the, uh, all of our participants and there's, and their status, if we, if we have their documents with their address and everything, all their information on the spreadsheet. And that is what we, we actually uh, manage them on, manage the, the, uh, the, the, the people with, uh, because we group them by cohorts, the welding cohorts, machine cohorts, whatever the date they start, the date that they end, uh, their hours in the program, all of that. We, uh, we keep up with all of that on, on, a, on a separate spreadsheet than the TIF. Uh, the TIF we basically use for reporting, and uh, mm -hmm. most of the information will come off of uh, our our spreadsheet where we tracked all the progress on for the individual, uh, and uh, that because it's easier to manage by cohorts because of the dates and everything, and we can at a glance see uh, where where we're at in the process uh, with with the spreadsheet, uh, and uh, the uh, our case manager is responsible for getting the, the documents from the school. Now the school knows what documents that they, they have to collect for someone who is uh, uh, planning on being funded by the SSF program. The, the school staff knows this. And so uh, the director, uh, the uh, head uh, lead of the school, uh, he makes sure that those documents are collected as well. But our case manager will be at orientation that they Lost need him. for the individuals. Thank you, Thomas. I see uh, we were able to connect. Philip, Philip, are you connected now? Uh, we're having connection problems for some reason. Okay. We crashed a couple of times and our, and our employer uh, doesn't, have, doesn't have video, only audio. So okay. they're only available to audio. Thank you. Abby, do we have any questions from the audience? No, ma'am, we don't have any questions from the audience, although I do have a couple for you, um, just myself. Right. Uh, first one being, what support services have you found or have that are beneficial to helping participants gain employment? Uh, would Erin, would you like to take that question? What support services have you found that has been beneficial with the trainees going through the program? Yeah. Uh it really does depend on the particular uh, client. Uh, I, I hate using it depends as an answer. Uh, okay. During the onboarding process, we, we have a, a lengthy intake form that, and several interviews where we'll try to ascertain what challenges or barriers might prevent uh, that particular client from being successful. Because uh, when, we're, when we're accepting someone into a program, we're thinking already about that end step of employment and what resources do they need in order to be successful then so we can start to problem solve those uh, as early as the, the first interview with us. Uh, so I, I think in broad strokes, I'd say childcare support, uh, sometimes food insecurity, so food resources and transportation are the primary barriers that we try to address. Uh, and then right under that, I would say um, also lack of tools and maybe equipment. So some of the industries that we train for do require that you know you show up with boots and you have a conduit vendor and you have other you know t uh, your own tool set. So we also provide those or partner with our local workforce board in order to provide those services and resources. And and if I can add, we also have a student success coordinator that really coordinates all those services together and is laser focused on making sure that. All of our students are connected to the right support services, whether it be the childcare or transportation or all the other things that Erin was sharing. So uh, they, she also follows up with them after graduation and makes sure that they're, they have everything that they need so that they'll be successful. Great, great. And with us, we, well, with us, we, we help them with a uh, acquired driver's license. Uh, we found out that a lot of our students didn't have driver's license, they had IDs Texas ID license, but uh, I mean, ID, but they didn't have the driver's license and a lot of employers started requiring that. So mm -hmm. we made sure that they, you know, if they had surcharges by us being a nonprofit, uh, we would set up for community service to be done and 
we would set that up through the court system so them so that they could uh uh get the surcharges taken off so they could get their driver's license so things like that made a big difference in and a lot of them feeling good about going into the program because that was a major barrier that kind of discouraged them from day one and so once we uh, assure them that we would also assist in that area. Uh, they they came on board and, and they were real uh, supportive of uh, doing what they needed to do in order for uh, them to stand up the best chance they could to get hired once they finished the training. Thank you. Abby, any more questions? Sure, just one more. Um, is it difficult to place participants with employment? Who would like to take that? Um, I, I'll, I'll start. I think uh, I don't, for us, I don't see it as a, as there's a difficulty in placing our students. I think the secret sauce is the relationship that you have with employers. That is absolutely uh, key in building those partnerships and, and relationships. And uh, it, for SkillPoint, we have those relationships and they've been built very over the years and throughout the years. And so, um, we bring our employers into our trainings, they mentor, they're a part of the training, they help design some of the trainings even. So I think for us, it's, it's really a great, uh, a great partnership in, in such that when students graduate, in, in some cases, they've been hired, we've had one employer and hire, hire every single student out of a class. So building those relationships is, is um, super important. And so for us, it's, it's a real it's a real easy transition and I know you, nothing's easy, right? But it's a, it's a transition that we find uh, that's been pretty successful. Good, thank you. We, we have some fantastic employers that we've built relationships with over the years that they give these guys a shot at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at for in, in initial employment. And uh, they, they are really a fantastic and they, uh, 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 I had somebody walk in my office distracted me. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. People be coming in and out as I'm trying to go through the conference here. I need to ha have a sign. I'm in a conference. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but, I, but our employees have been fantastic. And, and, and like Kevin said, our curriculum was designed with the input from the employers to give the employers the skill sets that they need uh, for an entry-level employee. And that, we built our whole uh, educational uh, uh, curriculum around that. The employers and the, the skill sets that they need for entry level employers. But uh, these guys, a lot of these guys, they give the guys a chance. We probably half of our population are reentry guys. Uh, that's an easy population to recruit from. They get out of prison, they got a family they need to take care of, they don't have any job or job skills. Hey, man, that's just you know, low, low hanging fruit, you know, for the program. And uh, these employers have been so good to give these guys a chance. And some of those guys have made some of our best students. And I, and I employers say that they've made some of their best workers. Thank you. Thank you all panelists for participating today. This concludes our session. Please join us for our next session. It will be the JET program, uh, FY21 updates and presentation, which is scheduled to begin at 12.30 p.m. Thank you again. And I hope you all continue to enjoy our conference. Thank you. Thank you.